If you're seriously considering buying analog hardware and you're wondering if it is a good decision in today's context, hold on. Don't make a hasty decision before watching this video. Deciding to purchase analog hardware isn't an easy choice. There are many factors to consider, starting with the budget, but there are also other relevant things to think about. By the end of this video, I hope you'll be able to make a more informed decision about whether diving into the world of analog hardware is right for you, or if it might be better to stick with plugins, at least for a while. I currently work with a hybrid system incorporating quite a few pieces of analog gear. However, it wasn't always this way. In fact, for most of my career, I exclusively work with plugins and I still use many plugins in my workflow. But now that I look back, starting with mixing using plugins helped me understand the distinct character of each unit. I learned what kind of sounds I could achieve with certain types of preamps, compressors, and so on. This knowledge greatly assisted me when I bought my first analog equipment because I already had a prior understanding of the units that worked for me and those that didn't as much. So if you are just starting out with mixing, I would recommend to stick with plugins for a while because of this reason. Once you get to know your plugins, you'll know which analog hardware you'll wanna buy. So why I made the decision to get into analog gear? You see, after all these years using plugins and mixing in the box, I felt I hit a point where my productions and mixes weren't getting better, no matter what I did. I remember I was using a lot of plugins to try get the sound I had in my mind. And still after all that processing, it was kind of where I wanted, but also not really. So at that point, I decided to get into analog hardware. And I think it was around 2020 that I bought my first units. The SSL Fusion with the Heritage Audio 609A compressor. But since then, I've been gradually adding different devices to my collection. I remember when I was doing some research about which unit to buy first. I asked myself, what would be best to start with? A preamp, an EQ, a compressor. That's probably the very first thing you might need to consider. And for this, I have a golden rule. Go from big to small. So following this rule, you want to start with the mix bus and then work your way down from the most crucial elements of the mix to the less important ones. For example, depending on the music style you create, the second thing you might tackle could be the lead vocals, then the drums and later on bass, guitar, and so forth, until you have all the equipment you need. Now, specifically speaking about the mix bus, the question arises, what kind of processing do we need and which devices should we buy? What are the audio inputs and outputs requirements? And very important, how high my budget should be? Ultimately, does all this effort justify itself compared to mixing and mastering using just plugins? Generally, basic mix bus processing involves an equalizer and a compressor. In my case, when I bought my first equipment, I went for the SSL Fusion because to me it offered a lot of value for the price. At the time, I think it was around $2,000, which, you know, it's not that much if you consider all it offers. It not only has a simple equalizer, but also saturation, a high frequency compressor, which can also be switched to a parallel compressor, a switchable transformer and a stereo imaging processor. And I also added the Heritage Audio 609A compressor, which is the same type of compressor as the classic Neve 33690. And this was my main mix bus compressor for a long time, and I really liked its smooth sound. This compressor also costs around $1,800. So we're talking about a total of $3,800 to $4,000 for a basic but very effective mix bus chain. And of course, you don't need to buy the same two units. There are also tons of other great options available. For example, there is the Bus Plus from SSL, which is an awesome compressor that offers a lot of value. 
And if you're looking for a more affordable version, you can check out the Warm Audio's take on the same type of compressor, the Bass Comp, which costs around 800 bucks and gets the job done. Now to connect your analog gear, you need an interface with at least two line inputs and outputs. You'll connect the compressor first, then the equalizer, and then back to the interface. The main idea is that you'll mix through them, meaning you have them on from the beginning of your mix, listening to the output of the devices all the time. Having a mixed chain like this is a great starting point and for many sufficient to add some analog coloration to your productions. It offers an easy and relatively accessible setup and you know, if you are making music professionally, I think it's an investment worth considering. I know you could argue that with 4000 bucks you can get a lot of plugins. And while true, in the end, I actually prefer having two pieces of equipment that I can trust and I know I'll use always. And that I'll take the time to fully understand rather than having a bunch of plugins that will end up gathering digital dust. Of course, plugins offer a simpler workflow, but as long as you stick to around two or three pieces of equipment for the mix bus, things remain relatively straightforward. It starts to get a bit more complicated when you want to expand your gear and add more analog processing. Firstly, of course, you have to consider your budget, each of these devices can cost you anywhere from 500 bucks for the cheaper ones to several thousand dollars. And for each new chain, we also need a free physical input and output in our audio interface for each channel. For example, if we would like to expand the mix bus processing, say with an EQ and a compressor for the lead vocals, we would need an interface with at least three line inputs and outputs in total. And this would be two for the stereo mix bus and one for the main mono vocal. And so if you're planning on adding a bunch of analog gear to your setup, it would be clever to think ahead and buy an audio interface with efficient inputs and outputs. Please don't make the same mistake I did. I bought an Apollo X6 thinking it was going to be more than enough. Then I had to add an extra Apollo X8 to be able to add more gear. So actually, it would have been better and cheaper to buy an Apollo X16 from the beginning. So think carefully about your I.O. needs before pulling the trigger. But free space in your audio interface is not all you need. The more hardware units you add, the more physical space in your studio you require, which might not be available for everyone. There are some great desks out there that offer some rack space, when I bought my desk, I thought 18 units of rack space would be more than enough. But then I realized it wasn't that much actually. So I had to buy a separate side rack, which you can see over there, to mount all my gear. You should also take into account that some of these units get really hot and you often have to leave a little bit of pace between them to allow proper ventilation. Also important to consider is the cabling required to keep everything organized. Typically it's worth having a patch bay once you have a certain number of devices because you know with a patch bay you can freely route the devices regardless of their default connections. But to do this you need to factor in that you need four cables per channel. One cable from the interface to the patch bay, another from the patch bay to the device and two cables back. So for a stereo device you need eight cables which at around 20 bucks per cable amounts to 160 bucks per unit. Now I want to address perhaps the most important point of this whole video. Is the sound improvement significant enough to justify all this effort? But before I answer this, let me ask you to subscribe to the channel and give the video a like if you're finding value in this content. And if you want to support the channel, the best way to do so is by working with me as a mix engineer or master engineer for your next production. I'll leave my website link below where you can find all the information you need. Thanks a lot and let's get back to the video. Coming back to the question, is the sound improvement worth the investment in buying analog gear? Well, in my personal opinion, yes. Definitely. 
Coming from years of working exclusively with plugins, I've noticed an enhancement in my mixes since I started working with analog equipment. Now I can already hear some of you saying that great engineers like Jason Joshua, Michael Brower or Andrew Sheps mix exclusively inside the box. And while that's true, I have some arguments for you. Firstly, the tracks they receive are of extremely high quality, mostly recorded using analog hardware, often with some compression and EQ at the input stage. Secondly, their arrangements are meticulously crafted and thought out. As you know, the influence of musical arrangements on the final sound is immense. Lastly, many of them send their mixes to mastering engineers who provide a final layer of polish, often using top-of-the-line analog equipment. With that said, it's more than understandable that analog hardware isn't for everyone for many reasons, I mentioned it in this video. We've come a long way with plugins nowadays and there are many convenient aspects of working with plugins. However, there's a certain magic that analog equipment brings that can't be replaced by plugins, in my opinion. And if you want to also know my opinion about whether hardware offers a faster workflow than plugins or not, here's our video where I talk just about that. See you there.